lived here um, and they used the resources that were here. Um, you know, obviously there wasn't all the houses built here and, uh, you know, they needed to make spears and needed to make uh, uh, axes. And uh, they would use uh, the creek lines where there's lots of uh, rock in the creek. It's got to be the right sandstone, it's not just any sandstone. And the water's running over it and they'd sit there, the fellas, and they'd grind up axe heads out of stone. And you can still visit some of those places today. And there's some still around here, actually. And some people here have probably been and seen those types of things. And they would use certain tools, um, scrapers and things to cut with, like knives. Um, and some of these are actually still around here. And uh, some of the material actually comes from here, Meriwether. Um, so you have the Meriwether church. And that's... Uh, uh, the stone that was used to make stone tools. Um, and as I said, you can go to some places today and pick up those stone tools and have a look at them still. So just because there's a lot of uh, building and that type of thing that's taken place, it doesn't mean that our uh, traditional cultural heritage uh, archaeologically is, is gone and it's not there. It's still there and a lot of it's buried under the ground, but there's still stuff, there's some stuff um, at Wickham actually, in the paddock, bit of a paddock there, um, and there's uh, two artefacts scattered still there, 19 artefacts on the top of the ground, which you'd never think would be there, but it, they are. And the Palais is another one of those things, you know, the, it, and it's been one of those things, been a bit of flack here and there, and sorry for taking up time, but um, I, I tend to talk a little bit. But I think it's important for people to understand, you know, Palais was one of those things that was really good to have um, uh, for Newcastle because it shows that culture and heritage is still there. Even though you can't see it, it's still there. Um, and, uh, you know, when you consider there's three layers of occupation there, levels of occupation, and uh, they told a story about people that, that lived here for, for thousands of years. And uh, I'm really proud of that. Um, so it was a, a good outcome. The other thing is too is um, that uh, I don't obviously looking at me. I don't just have Aboriginal heritage. I have convict heritage too here. I have nine convicts in my family. One of them worked on the break wall here. Um, he came here in 1821. Um, John Preston, his name was, and he ended up having a child who's with an Aboriginal woman that's become my great-great-grandmother. Lots of stuff I could tell you, but um, we definitely have a connection here. Our Aboriginal connection and our European connection. Um, and uh, it's funny because Charlotte then um, tries to marry another convict. Uh, they weren't allowed to get married, um, but they had ten children. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and one of those children's actually buried in Christchurch Cemetery. So there's an Aboriginal boy buried up there. And so that just gives you a bit of a background of who we are. We're really um, excited about this exhibition. We, we were part of the LICEP exhibition and um, I had the, the opportunity and was honoured to, to write some stuff for the LICEP book. Um, and uh, we just uh, are looking forward to the good things that are going to come out of this whole um, collaboration. So anyway, a bit long-winded, but uh, I again just want to welcome everyone here today on behalf of the Wild Gold people. Thanks for uh, coming and uh, let's really get together and make this a really, really special thing. Um, next year, but um, I think it's something that can continue. And the other thing is too, I'll just say just before I finish, it's really important for us to remember that this whole landscape that we stand on um, contains culture and heritage that goes back thousands of years, goes back further than the pyramids. And it's really important. You know, people go and visit the pyramids and say this is a marvellous thing, you know. But we have 
cultural heritage that's here, a lot older than that. And we sometimes don't tend to give that a thought. Um, we'd like to see our cultural heritage protected, and, um, and uh, the best way for that is that everyone get together and we look for the best ways to, to make that happen. So anyway, welcome today from the Wonderful People. Thank you very much, Shane, for that wonderful introduction to this country and welcome to country. I too acknowledge the Awakable people and their elders, past and present, and Aboriginal people who are here today. As I said, my name's Alex Byrne, I'm the State Librarian, and on behalf of the Library Council of New South Wales, the State Library of New South Wales Foundation, and my colleagues who've brought some of our uh, treasures here for you to, to look at today, to sample, I'm delighted to see so many people here to launch this joint venture of celebrating the early history of Newcastle. The Minister for the Arts, the Honourable George Souris, MP, regrets that he cannot be with us today, but he asked me to convey his greetings to all and his strong support for this project. Many of you will recall that he officiated at the unveiling of the Captain James Wallace album in the Newcastle Art Gallery, a joyous occasion on which portraits of workable <coughs> individuals were viewed in this place in which they were painted for the first time since they were painted nearly two centuries ago. We're here to launch a most exciting project which extends from the State Library's landmark acquisition of that Wallace album and will tell the story of Newcastle's origins as a coal centre and major port. The story will be revealed in an exciting and wondrous exhibition titled Treasures of Newcastle from the Macquarie Era, from the 2nd of March to the 5th of May next year at the Newcastle Art Gallery. The exhibition will showcase the unique Newcastle collections of both the State Library of New South Wales and the Newcastle Art Gallery. And I would like to particularly thank Ron Ramsey and the Newcastle Art Gallery for generously hosting this exhibition and working so collaboratively with us to show our combined treasures. The exhibition will be supported by an illustrated catalogue by expert curator Elizabeth Ellis, specialist school education programs, an online presence and a series of high profile community public programs. In accordance with the library's policy of opening up its treasures to the widest possible audiences, the exhibition will be free and will be accompanied by a wealth of online materials. I'm especially pleased to announce that Noble Resources has accepted our invitation to be the principal partner of Treasures of Newcastle from the Macquarie era. We're particularly delighted to have Noble Resources as a partner as it highlights the very special relationship which the library has with this region. You will know that it was the Hunter Coalfields which provided the wealth of David Scott Mitchell who gave his magnificent collection to endow the State Library and whose name we honour in the name of the Mitchell Library. <coughs> the State Library is committed to collecting the documentary history of Australia and making it accessible to all Australians and worldwide. We are one of the great libraries of the world and our recent success in obtaining state government funding to make our incomparable collections widely available online will cement our standing as a centre of digital excellence. Treasures of Newcastle from the Macquarie era continues this aim of sharing our collections and resources with the communities in Newcastle and the Hunter. Treasures of Newcastle from the Macquarie era will feature the extraordinary legacy of Captain James Wallace, one of the city's most important founding fathers. It will include the famous Macquarie Collector's Chest, illustrations of which you can see over to my left, which was commissioned by Wallace in Newcastle as a gift for Governor Macquarie. It will be the first time that the Macquarie Collector's Chest will return to Newcastle in 195 years. <laughs> and 
as we stand here today on this magnificent site overlooking the sea next to the port, it's important to remember that between 1816 and 1818, when Captain James Wallace of the 46th Regiment was Commandant of the then Penal Settlement, he not only oversaw the expansion of Newcastle through a program of significant infrastructure development, but he was also responsible for the cultural flowering of the settlement, employing many convicts under his charge to paint watercolours, make furniture, engrave prints. During this time, it's fair to say that Newcastle is home to the most vibrant cultural scene in the infant New South Wales. Wallace understood the importance of building robust infrastructure. During his tenure, Wallace improved the settlement of Newcastle by constructing new public and government buildings, including the convict hospital, a jail, barracks, a prominent Christchurch, a boathouse, lumberyard, a workshop, and a school. He also initiated the long-term project to create a magnificent working harbour by building the breakwater between the mainland and Nobby's and deepening its entrance. On display in Treasures of Newcastle from the Macquarie era at the Newcastle Art Gallery next year will be the Captain James Wallace album, his own copy of an illustrated book he published about his colonial experiences in London in 1821, entitled An Historical Account of the Colony of New South Wales. This copy, which we acquired last year from a deceased estate in Canada, was previously unknown. It's a unique copy of the book, which was embellished by Wallace himself with drawings and watercolours of colonial views, images of the recently explored interior of New South Wales, portraits of Aborigines of this district, and natural history illustrations made in Newcastle in that period, in about 1818. The Wallace album is dominated by Newcastle subjects. The large plates of Newcastle, several views of the Hunter River, exotic flora and fauna such as the black swan on Lake Macquarie and kangaroo set in the Newcastle district. Most importantly, it provides a snapshot of the Awagabal people through named portraits, a most unusual occurrence at that time. It includes Burrigan, the chief of the Newcastle tribe with whom Wallace had struck up a relationship. These extraordinary early records are critical for understanding our past, particularly in providing rare and precious records of the ancestors of the Aboriginal community of today's Newcastle, as Shane has told us. For many Newcastle people, one of the most important aspects of treasures of Newcastle from the Macquarie era is the inclusion of the elaborate Macquarie collector's chest. Acquired by the State Library in 2004, it travelled to England after Governor Macquarie had taken it with him in 1822. It's a portable campaign chest made of red cedar and rose mahogany and contains the most wonderful collection of natural history specimens in excellent condition. Trays of birds, shells, seaweed, insects, all of which come from the Hunter District. It is decorated with oil paintings on cedar panels. Many of the scenes of Newcastle are those which also feature in the Wallace album and painted by the same artist, the talented convict, Joseph Lycett. Other rare material to be exhibited in March next year will be the Newcastle Gallery's own Joseph Lycett oils and Richard Brown's Awakable portraits, as well as other treasures from Quarry's visit to Newcastle in 1818. Here to my left, we've brought today a taste of what you'll be able to see in the exhibition next year. One of the earliest detailed maps of Newcastle, 1819, just after Wallace's time here. It's on show for the first time. And a letter by Wallace where he fondly recalls the beauty of the Newcastle district and his hunting expeditions with Burrigan, whose portrait, as I said, is in the Wallace album. This material is accompanied by important artwork from the Newcastle Art Gallery. A series of community events will allow this important historical story to be shared with the community of Newcastle and a wider national and international audience. We're very keen that this exhibition will have the widest educational impact. 
So the exhibition will be accompanied by a catalogue and a school education program. It's a major landmark undertaking. So we and our partners in this venture, Noble Resources, are keen to find additional partners to support the project, to assist with the delivery of the education programs and the acquisition of another important colonial item by Joseph Lyset for inclusion in the exhibition and addition to the collection of the Newcastle Gallery. The Newcastle Gallery dearly wishes to acquire this item, but it will need your assistance. Thank you all so much for coming to this important launch. This is intended to be the first in a series of key events leading up to treasures of Newcastle from the Macquarie era. We look forward to seeing you all at the exhibition and various events from March next year. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Ron Ramsey, Director of the Newcastle Art Gallery, to say a few words and introduce Lord Mayor McCloy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you, Shane. Um, well, it's uh, such a pleasure to be working with the State Library again. We had a lovely time last year with the, the Wallace album. It's terrific to, to work collegiately with, with the staff. But here we've got many, many historians who know more about Newcastle's backgrounds and, and, has, and have had attempts to get the collector's chest here often. I can see Keith and Suzanne and there's Johnny. There's a number of you here and really we never thought this would happen, did we? We just hadn't a clue that we would get this Macquarie chest back here. So much so that uh, the Art Gallery commissioned um, contemporary artists to respond to the Macquarie chest, and we uh, created the Newcastle chest, which will also be on display uh, in this exhibition. So it's fantastic, and thank you, State Library, for making it happen. The person who has spent more time than anybody else on the planet researching that Macquarie chest is Elizabeth Ellis, and we're delighted that Elizabeth will be working and curating the exhibition that will be on display at the, at the Newcastle Gallery. We're also grateful to Shane because it's possible that Shane's forebears were very helpful in gathering and sourcing some of those items that are included uh, in the Macquarie chest. But I particularly wanted to mention another um, connection between the State Library and Newcastle Art Gallery, and that is that the two institutions own, between us, the major holdings of the works of Joseph Lysett. No other art gallery in Australia owns oil paintings by Joseph Lysett. And the, the three works that we have are truly significant. And we've brought one of them here with us today. <coughs> I just thought I'd briefly mention a little bit about uh, Lysett. Um, and I, I thought about it and think, you know, he's really a bit of, he'd be, it'd be a great movie, Joseph Lysett you know, returns, and I was thinking maybe Russell Crowe would be great. <laughs> uh, Lysett was born in 1775, and the age of six was orphaned and uh, lived with his uncle and then his uncle dies when he's 14 and so he goes to live with his sister with another, another uncle. And we're not sure much about his artistic background but we think he, he did show promise um, but we do have records of a Jay Lysett working for Wedgwood. And so because he was born in Staffordshire we think that that's probably a logical connection. He had two daughters by two different women and uh, then 1811 he was found with a printing press and some very clever engraving on copper, which happened to be in banknotes, and they found <laughs> banknotes as well. So, uh, of course, he was sentenced to transport and came out here in, in 1813. He came out in a ship with another well-known fellow called Francis Greenway. And when they arrived here, <coughs> Governor Macquarie, he, he recognised their skills and he thought, well, we'll give you a, a leave, and you'll pardon leave. So they had to go and find their own... Uh, work and Lysett found work with uh, an engraving and publisher and then ended up working in the police office, which is interesting. Isn't it? <laughs> and so there he met a man called Henry Dale, and Henry Dale was also a forger. So they decided to put their old skills back together. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, Henry wasn't quite as smart as Joseph because Henry went and spent 25 of the five shilling notes in a day, and of course, they sourced them. <laughs> Joseph. So then Macquarie said, okay, you two, I've given you a go. Now get ye off to the Siberia of Sydney, Newcastle. So they were here for three years, 1815 to 1818. And in that time, 
the life that has produced these wonderful things, both the chest and the paintings that we have. He didn't have it easy, though. And remember in our movie, we're going to have to make up a little bit, so where there wasn't any historical connection, we, we think that possibly it was hard labour for Lysette in his first 18 months in Newcastle. But then enter stage left comes, I think, Colin Firth as Captain Wallace. <laughs> and Captain Wallace comes in, and he's an amateur painter, has his oil paints in his pocket, and notes that Lysette is not bad at that. So he encourages him to do that. We then have uh, Lysett who lives in Newcastle and goes and lives in Sydney for until 1822. Um, Macquarie, and Macquarie, I was probably thinking we'd cast someone, uh, maybe Jeremy Irons or someone like that. And anyway, he, he gave him um, a par an absolute pardon on the last day of his governorship in Sydney. And so that enabled Lysette to pack up, to get his two daughters, and head off back to England. Of course, the question is, we don't know quite where he got all the money to fund that ship back to uh, England. We've got an idea how he might have. But anyway, he arrives back and sets up in Chelsea in London, where he goes about to produce an incredible book called The Views in Australia. And those sort of views of Australia were very popular publications, but unfortunately, they had gone a little bit off the boil. And so by the time he produced it, uh, it didn't sell too well. It was even remaindered. And so um, a few of the books really remained because when they were sold off cheaply, a lot of them were broken up and the engravings were then framed. And, and we have some of those engravings in the collection that were originally in the book. And so curiously, he then leaves London, goes to around Birmingham. Uh, he was doing it tough. And of course, what does he do but return to the thing he'd probably be best and uh, a policeman goes knocking on his door and unfortunately he could see what was ahead of him. He runs upstairs, gets a knife and cuts his own throat. Terrible, terrible. And he didn't die there though, he went to hospital, he was recovering and then thought about his future and the great rumour is that possibly he reopened the wound and he died then in 1828. So it really is the stuff of movies, it's fantastic. But what we've brought for you today from the Newcastle Art Gallery is a painting um, done around 1817, 1818, which um, Lysett actually did here in this location. He actually did it in the parade ground of Fort Scratchley. And you look across up to what's now known as the hill, but it's actually Prospect Hill then. And at the very top of that hill, you'll see a little tiny dot, which is the Christchurch Cathedral, which there was much debate about whether Lysett had much hand in the design of that. It's probably just proved, but he did do a couple of paintings uh, which have long been lost which a lady, Franklin, actually said were dreadful paintings, so probably not the reason why they're gone. But it's a wonderful painting, painted on a, a timber panel, which we think had come from a, a disused piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. The other two licenses that we have in the collection are painted on canvas, which a conservator has told us is actually sailcloth, and are very important works which we purchased uh, as actually paintings by Wallace, and then found them to be by license. The other work that is in the showcase is actually on loan to us. It's been offered to us for sale. And where we had this beautiful painting purchased for us by Paul Baratar Cole in the 1990s, this one is on offer and we are, as uh, Alex mentioned, looking for a sponsor to help purchase this work because we feel it is so much about the life of Lysette. And there, here's just one of the major characters that's going to be featured in this incredible exhibition that will be at Newcastle Art Gallery, one of the last exhibitions that we'll be having before we close to embark on our adventure, the redevelopment of the gallery. But it gives me much pleasure now to introduce the Lord Mayor of Newcastle, Jeff McCoy. Thank you, Ron, and to Shane for his welcome to the country. I've been officially welcomed from the State Library, Alex Byrne and Peter Crossin, along with Rob Thomas of the Library, Council of New South Wales. In September 1797, Lieutenant John Shortland came, became the first European to explore the area. Of particular interest to me in this collection certainly is the uh, Government Quarry Collector's Chest. Um, I have had a look at it. Uh, I understand it will be coming here by road and the truck has to have special suspension so this thing is extremely fragile. 
But being an old fisherman, I've had a look at the fish and I can assure you those fish are still available here today. Not being very skilled with birds, and I do recognise the birds that are in this box, and I would certainly hope that the shell collection, which is a bit too small and there's photographs in my eyes, are still here as well. Over the next two years, after uh, September 1797, coal mine from the area was the colony's first export. And that's a significant thing. But from these paintings, of course, when you come in by a ship or the water, even I could find the coal, of course, it's sticking out there in, in big lumps. By the turn of the century, the mouth of the Hunter River was being visited by diverse groups of men, including coal diggers, timber cutters, and more escaped convicts. <laughs> I don't know if any of his relatives were there, but mine could have been. <laughs> Under Captain James Wallace, a building boom began. And that boom delivered some of our city's most treasured buildings. We are truly fortunate to have an opportunity to explore the historical roots of our city through the Captain James Wallace album, the Government Oriental Collector's Chest, and other unique collections. But this ex exhibition would not have been possible without the generous support of noble resources. And I should suggest to Chris Thorogood that companies such as he, his do not get enough recognition for the things they do. And um, it's some modesty sometimes with some companies they give for the right reasons, but certainly recognition of what his company has done um, should be applauded. This exhibition is sure to inform, educate, surprise and delight. It will provide the citizens of Newcastle and the Hunter region with an opportunity to celebrate the early European history, but also importantly for the Awabakal people and their descendants as these drawings and documents record the history of the Aboriginal people in the area. <clears throat> to quote Robert Penn Warren, history cannot give us a program for the future but it can give us a fuller understanding of ourselves and of a common humanity so that we can better face the future. Newcastle today is a great city, a world-class destination, and as the capital of the heart of Australia's sixth largest city, we, are, we were and still are the city of enterprise. Freshmen's and look at these treasures that are just a small taste of what you'll see in the exhibition from March to May next year. Thank you. Thank you.